Hello and welcome to Quilt Addicts Anonymous. I'm Stephanie Sabine. So today we're going to do a replay of our Jelly Roll rug tutorial. We have done many, 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 many. We have them on the original Jelly Roll rug. We have them on Jelly Roll Squared. We have them on the pie one that's a circle. We have the placemats and pillows. You can watch all of them, including how to fix it if it's getting all wavy on you. We did a dedicated tutorial on what happens when you wash it and how to fix it if it gets super wavy. But the reason why we're doing the replay today is we were going through our warehouse and we discovered that we have some of the Caroline Freelander strip rolls from Robert Kaufman. This was from her latest release, Architectures. And it is in this very neutral gray, like taupe grayish white colorway, which looks fabulous in a Jelly Roll rug. And whenever we have kits with these, they are like gone in a second. Let me show you some of the ones that we've done. So that way you can get a sense for what this looks like. This is the original one that I did in the Chalk and Charcoal uh, by Jennifer Shampoo. And it is really fabulous. We actually have a new collection. This is the new Chalk and Charcoal. Um, but it is in a rainbow. And this is the one that got like wavy on me. So this was the very first one I did. And you know, I, I learned some lessons with this one. And then we moved on to the straight version. And this one you guys went crazy for as well. This one is a lot easier to do, a lot easier to get it straight. And we have lots of great tips for you on how to do that. And again, this would look absolutely fantastic. This is just a great color in homes. It looks really, really good. And so then finally, we ended up doing one where I showed you how to do it without needing to iron. Because what I ultimately discovered with these is that if you are needing to iron and spray starch it in order to get it to lie flat, it's not gonna stay flat when it's on the ground. So it needs to be flat as you are creating it. You, if you are having to force it down with spray starch, with iron, with Marianne's Best Press, that thing is constantly gonna be popping up on you when it is on the floor. So we talk about how to make sure to ease in the fabric when you're going around the curve, so that way it stays nice and flat. In today's video, we talk about how to prep everything and why it does make a difference to do it with the Jelly Roll rug battings. Um, they're a little bit thinner, they do lay flatter. I've made one with just scraps that I have and it does make a really big difference. That thing was wavy. That is the one that we ended up using in the video where I talked about how to fix it if it is messed up. And this one does have some volume to it right now because it has been folded on my shelf I think since I made it and took the photographs. But like I said, this colorway, I mean, it looks good always, always in a Jelly Roll rug. You start at the center with your lights and then you just follow it out. We have a bunch of these, but they do tend to go fast. Um, but we just, we never put these online and we discover them in our warehouse. And we're like, we gotta get those out there. Those, the, the quilters are gonna love them. But we're gonna take a peek at some of the other ones that we have too. Um, one way to tell if a Jelly Roll rug is gonna look good or not, if you're gonna like it, is just to look at it from the top. And if you like the way that it looks, like here's that, that gray one, like that's a classic look. That's gonna look good. Um, but if you like the way it looks from the top, you probably are gonna like the way it looks in a rug. This one is the latest Laurel Birch um, collection to come out. This one is Fiesta Horses. So there's a lot of metallic in this. It has two distinctive colorways in it. There is a brown and sort of a jewel tones in there. So it really, this one would be a very busy rug. Um, there will be a lot going on in it. And the Laurel Birch is priced higher because there's metallic and Laurel Birch is quite the following. And pre-cuts from Clothworks in general are generally priced a little higher. So don't have sticker shock when you get there, I've warned you already. Um, but it is really pretty and it is a gorgeous collection. We can show you some collages um, in the video to show you like what all fabrics are in this, but you really just kind of see the color. So what you see here is what you're gonna end up seeing in the, the real deal. We shockingly still have some Tula Pink Jelly Rolls from her last collection, Daydreamer. Um, this was a really bright and fun one. I have made a Tula rug and oh my gosh, did it turn out absolutely fantastic. My daughter loved it. It was in her bedroom for a long time. 
Um, so this is this would be a good one to do a rug with or, or anything. If you've been searching for the Tula Jelly Roll and you can't find it, we still have some. Shocking, I know, but we do have quite a few actually still left. I showed you this one already. This is a new Jennifer shampoo, shamp how do we say shampoo, but I think it's shampoo. Um, it is a basics collection. It is a really good one to do a quilt like this in because you're gonna be able to get that rainbow effect as you, it goes out and further out. It is really pretty. And when we look at it from the top, you can see you're gonna get that rainbow swirl really would make a very pretty rug. Now, if we have purple fans, I know that like, black, white, and red quilts are really big. This one would be black, white, and purple. It is really pretty, it's from Clothworks. Uh, it's called Purple Rain. It's so pretty and you can see all the colors and fun stuff from above. And again, you're really just gonna kind of see little bites of fabric because the, the strips are not very wide by the time they get quartered over, but they are gorgeous. And so you could do it like this where it just is turning by the print or you could line it all up so that you have all your whites in the center and then your grays, your purples, and your blacks. It's totally up to you. And lastly, we have a cotton and steel one left. This is called Frolic and it's very trendy colors. It's got those blues and the citrons and just a really fun one. I think this would be a good one to have out in spring and summer. And these are fast projects. I made mine, this one in about eight hours and the squared one here, that took about six because you're not having to first piece all of your strips together into one giant, like essentially binding strip. So these can go fairly quickly. If you are a newbie and you have never done it before, I would totally start with one of these because it goes so much faster, so much easier to get it to go right. Um, then I would say the oval is the next difficult followed by the circle. Now the circle is totally doable if you set it up right and you go slow. Um, that one I think is in storage somewhere. Maybe I can grab it, but it, that one is super fun too. Let me grab the placemats and the pillows so you can see that as well. All right, so one strip roll will get you two placemat or four placemats um, or two pillows. You can, you can mix and match that however you want. And then there are extras that you can use to make little coasters out of. Now this is pretty thick stuff because by the time you're done with it, you've got four layers of batting, four layers of quilting fabric. So I think this would be okay to put like a hot dish on as well. If you wanna do a nice long runner for the center of your table, that would be really pretty. I mean, these are just gorgeous. I mean, you don't see much. You really see the color and a teeny bit of the design, but they are really, really very pretty and they look great. So this is a circle one and it actually is still, this is the flattest one I've ever done. It's a circle one. It just works so well. It looks so pretty, but this is a good example of what it looks like when you do a rainbow one, because you will just have that subtle color transition as it comes out. And if I iron this, uh, because it was stored like crumpled in a ball, um, then it would totally be absolutely completely flat. So that is a really exciting thing. I will tell you a funny story. So this was, used to be on the floor of our shop in front of a rocking chair when um, we had a brick and mortar store and we had a husband come in and he came in through a door that was like not the right door. And he sees this rug and it was snowy out. And he walked over to it and then just like scrapes his boots on it and sits down. And I'm just like, can you not see that this is not a rug for scraping your damn boots on? Like, come on, man. Like, I feel sorry for whatever your wife creates because you're probably gonna spill coffee on it and not appreciate it. But I cleaned it like immediately. I spot cleaned that sucker like as soon as he left and it looks okay. But uh, it probably could use a wash. But anyway, so, that's the risk you run when you make a rug. If you're worried about that, maybe make a placemat or a coaster or something. You still probably gonna spill something on it, but at least then that's what it, it's for. But anyway, so let's get into the tutorial. There's so many things you can do with this. There's so many different patterns, so many fun ways to use it. Super addicting, but I hope you use all these fun tips and tricks to be able to make yours super flat so that way it's not puckering up and creating a trip hazard for you at home. So use the tips, have fun with it. Use those jelly rolls if you need a new one. We got some goodies, you can check them out. Especially that, um, this gray one. This, this will not hang around very long, this Carolyn Freelander one. Oh man, we have so many 
like this where people just love, love, love them. So check that out. And until next time, happy quilting. So you're gonna need a strip roll to do this. You're gonna need one of the Bozal batting rolls. I did make one of these with scraps. It was a hot mess, it never laid flat. Um, I just had to press the bejesus out of it. And then whenever you had to wash it, you had to do it again and that's still fun. So this is what you wanna use. You need a walking foot for your machine. You need a jeans needle. You need an entire spool of RFL thread. I am using this variegated one. It's super pretty. It is 4670. This is one I used on the original and it looks really great and adds a lot of texture and fun when you have a monochromatic one like this. And then we have a couple of new things that we're gonna check out here today. We have a blade saver thread cutter. We're gonna use an old blade. So that way when we are cutting apart all of those uh, strips when we create our big giant binding strip, we can just go over and hopefully save ourselves a ton of time. This little guy is from Purple Hobbies LLC. These are 3D printed right here in the US. So we don't have a ton of shipping delays with that because we were not having to get things from other countries. And then there's also this really cool jelly roll rug batting tool. So we featured something like this in a video we did on how to make a mask with ties back when you couldn't get elastic. And they make one that's a little bit longer. You can use it for your two and a half inch strips if you're trying to make some bias binding, but you also can use it to put both your batting roll and your piece in. And then it has this handy little clamp and they come in two different sizes depending on the width of your table, but you can just stick it right on there and then it'll feed straight into your sewing machine. So we're gonna give those guys a try today and see how much easier it makes it. So hopefully this will make it go a lot faster. I know the first time I did this, it took about eight hours or so from start to finish. So I'm gonna clock it in using these tools and see how much time I can save. All right, let's get into the tutorial. And as always, of course, you need the pattern as well. That's by RJ Designs. You can get that over at shop.quiltaddictsnamas.com. There's gonna be a couple little bits that we're not gonna show because the pattern designer has asked that we send you over to the pattern for that bit. But this will give you a lot of tips and tricks for when you're getting stuck at home. So the very first thing we wanna do is go ahead and get into that jelly roll. And we're going to take that apart. And I typically leave it in exactly the order that it came in. And usually they're doubled up in the strips, like you know, there's two of these sheep ones on top. I'm gonna leave that the way it is uh, because you really can't tell, you just kind of see the color change in this. You don't really see the design or that it's been two strips worth. So what we're gonna do is we're going to attach these just like we would quilt binding, but it's going to be like four times the biggest king size binding you've ever done. So it does take a little bit of time. What I like to do is just leave mine up next to my showing machine like that and then I'll just grab a piece over here and I will cover those and then I'm just gonna stitch from the top left to the bottom right and then when you open it up it should be nice and straight now there are some people who will chain stitch this entire thing. I did try it in one video and I found that I ended up with this really tangly mess. So I do cut my threads after every single one and then I just don't have that mess to deal with later. So I'm just gonna keep going and putting these together until I've got my entire strip together. I didn't think about it, but now's a really good time to test out this thread cutter. So there's some magnets on the bottom, which is great because when you close it, it really just locks together. So you don't have to worry about those bits being sharp. We also have some really nice little uh, pads so it will stay put on your table, which is also really nice. You do not want something sharp like that sliding around. So when you open it up, this little flower part comes out and I'm going to need to uh, take off this screw. All right, so once we've got our screw off, this part comes off. Then I'm gonna carefully remove my old rotary cutter blade. And it fits right in the center there. Then we can put this back on, matching our petals. Then we can put our screw right back in. You do have an exposed blade at this point, so do be careful as you're working on this part. All right, once you have that screw tightened, you get your magnets to close that in and then you're able to set it in. It's designed to go this way, according to the photo, so we can cut right on top. All right, back to sewing strips.
All right, so I've got a lap full of the biggest binding strip known to man. And I gotta start trimming my corners off. But first I wanna tell you what my thoughts about the thread cutter. First, I think it's really slick. I think it's designed really well. Um, I don't think you need it for this project. The only way I think you absolutely should get it for this project is if your sewing machine doesn't have a little blade on the front, um, then it's really nice to have that instead of having to grab your scissors all the time. But if you've got that little blade on the side of your sewing machine, you can just snip your threads that way. Or if you have an automatic thread cutter, I don't think you need it for this project. But if you like to chain piece, and I do, I like to chain piece all the time because it's really slick, saves me a ton of time. I think this is gonna be great because then I can just sit and pop every single seam on that without having to grab my scissors and I think it'll be really efficient for that. So I do think I'm gonna use this quite a bit, but I don't think you need it for this project. And I really like, because I've got kids, um, I, I like that there's a magnets in there. So when it's all done, I can grab it and I can store it in here. I can just pop that lid on and we're good to go. And it's designed really well because there's this little thumb hole here where you can pop it open, but there's no blade there. So there's no risk of cutting yourself and I can drop this I can flip it every which way and it's not popping open so I don't have to worry about it you know falling on the floor and rolling where my kids might get it or if one of them gets into it and drops it um, they really would have to uh, work at it to get it open and hurt themselves so I do like this I think it's a, a good thing to do if you like to chain piece um, I don't think you absolutely have to have it for this project all right so I'm gonna trim off all of the corners and then we're gonna be and I'm gonna press as I go as well and then we're going to be ready to start stuffing the strips with the batting. All right, so now we're gonna continue prepping this like the longest piece of binding we've ever done in our lives. We're gonna line the quarter inch mark of our ruler up with our seam. And I just trim this off with my rotary cutter and that goes super, super fast. All right, last one that I just cut off. Now I'm gonna get out my iron and we're gonna press the seams to the side and then we are gonna be ready to get going. So if we're gonna press all of these seams open, that will help reduce bulk as we are going. Now, this is where it starts to differ from where you're gonna prepare something for binding because we're not gonna fold this in half just yet. We're gonna wait until we have the batting inside to do that. So get that real nice and flat. And then what I like to do and what is recommended in the pattern is you're gonna take and you're gonna create a fan fold. About 12 inches is a good manageable size. And you're just going to go back and forth like that as you're working. And that will make it nice and manageable when we start stuffing it with the batting later. You'll have a nice stack of fabric and then you'll have your roll of batting. And as you work, you're gonna just continue flattening those seams out with your iron. All right, so now we're ready to start stuffing our batting into our fabric to create our tube that will eventually make our rug. So I've got my fan fold here, and then I have the side that I want on the outside out. The first time I made this, I made a mistake, and I thought that the tapered end would be on the inside of the rug. It's actually on the outside. So you wanna go with the darkest color to help hide the dust a little bit better. Now, I've already cut the taper here. You're gonna wanna make sure you refer to your pattern instructions to get the exact measurements on how to do it. That's one of those things that we can't show you per the request of the designer because support them. They're the ones who came up with this fabulous idea. They've got to eat too, so buy the pattern. All right, and then I've got my batting roll here too, and I've also cut that. And then I've got the batting roll in just a little bit from the end. Now we're gonna give this a try. This is that jelly roll and batting tube. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna slide that in. That taper makes it really easy. It goes in really nice and easy. And you can see it's already wanting to turn in, which is really nice. All right, so from this point, what we're gonna do is we're gonna fold in this top part, and then we're gonna fold in to the centers and then fold in on itself. Now, I get so many questions of people who are like, my batting roll is wider, and when you fold it in like this, the, uh, the batting is longer than your 
your strip. Um, that's just when you fold it, they start out the same length. Uh, they do make two and a half inch width, but I prefer the two and a half, and that's all that we carry here at shop.quiltmaticsonomist.com. And the reason why is when you fold this in, you're gonna be able to catch all that just fine. So you don't need to really worry about it if the things aren't meeting in the center the way you would like. All right, so this front part here, back to the taper, is a little tricky because you are gonna get it to be really skinny. So what you wanna do is you really wanna kinda work at that, and I find it's easier to use these batting clips to hold it in place rather than try to pin because this is a lot of layers, and we really want to make that nice and flat. But this is really doing, this tool is doing a great job of just holding it down. I'm just maybe gonna go a little bit more and grab a couple more clips just to get that first part started. But then I'm gonna clamp it onto my table and we're gonna start sewing. All right, that's doing a really good job of evenly feeding that through and really giving me a nice, good, clip here. Um, what I am going to do though, because I, I do feel like this is a little bit wider than if I would have stuffed it in, is instead of stitching down the middle, I'm going to move my needle over so that I'm stitching as close to this folded edge as possible. That way I'm sure that I'm going to be catching all of those layers and we won't have any little bits coming out. All right, so now I'm going to clamp this onto my table. There's a little pad on here so it's not going to hurt the bottom of your table. And you're just going to tighten up a little washer or a little nut there. All right, so I'm gonna take the first two clips off. I'm gonna put that underneath. And I'm gonna start with a little bit smaller stitch. I feel like it, it takes a little bit of time to get this going and your feed dogs to grab it. And the easiest way to do it is to grab your threads from the back and kind of give a tug on those. And of course mine just broke. So I'm just gonna advance it forward slowly a little bit until my strip is wide enough to grab it. There we go, now we're moving. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move my needle position over. So that way I can be stitching real close to that fold. Gonna move that over so it's in line. Maybe move this back a little. Let's see how that does. All right, so I'm running into a little bit of challenge here. It's coming apart and it's unfolding between when I get on there. I think what it needs is it needs to be up a little higher. I think it needs to be something that sits in or clamped onto an extension table. But it definitely is not working so well if it's having to travel from down here all the way up to there. I think it's meant to work more going straight forward. So we're gonna give that a go. Okay, this is working so much better now, and that's good because I really wanted to like this product because we've used some of their other stuff in the past and it has worked pat well. So um, I am doing a little bit of adjusting because I got a little going a little too fast. You cannot just go nuts with it. But what you can do is you can kind of just, when it comes out, you kind of put your fingers on top here, and then you just kind of want to go slow, and it will feed in nicely. Also, I think I'm gonna switch all of this over to this side. I think it's gonna feed in a little better that way. All right, so this isn't like adjustment free. When you bring it over, you still do have to mess with it a little bit to make sure that uh, everything is going inside. So what I've been doing is I just kind of tuck in that bottom edge and then I will put my hands on top and we'll be able to go forward that way. And I am sewing right next to that fold to make sure that I'm catching all of my pieces. And then once I get to the end there, I'm just gonna make sure that my tuck is looking good and it is. And so I'm gonna go ahead and push that down. And we're gonna go ahead and keep on going there. But it is feeding pretty nice. Every once in a while it's getting off, like right here, you can see the batting kind of wrapped around funny, but it's not that hard to get it back where it's just supposed to go. You do have to continually keep working on this. Like you can't get too far ahead of yourself and let this get tight. Otherwise it will not feed in the way it should.
All right, so I've reached my first color change and I've definitely figured this thing out. Do I think you absolutely need to have it? No, I think you can totally stuff this in on your own. But if you've had trouble, I think this could be really helpful for you. What I figured out that works best is you take a couple inches, just whatever distance it is from here to your needle, and you're gonna stick that to your batting piece and you're gonna make sure that your edges are nice and lined up. That'll help it feed in here a little better. And then I usually do a little adjustment here to make sure that it's feeding in nice and evenly. Then I still do a little tuck. I just run my finger in the inside of there and then I'll stick my fingers down just to hold that together. And then I am stitching with a 3.0 stitch length with the needle as far as it can go to the right with my feed dog still on this. So that way I'm stitching as close to those folded edges as possible because it's just not tucking it in as far as I would if I were doing it on my own. But I know that this is something that a lot of people have struggled with from the comments on the first video. So if you are one of those people, then this might be something for you. Again, once you get it done, just attach for about the same distance from here to here as it is from there to your needle. Give it a little adjustment to make sure that it's feeding in evenly. And then give a little tuck in here push it down with your fingers and sew. All right, I'm gonna keep on sewing and creating my giant ball. So what you wanna start doing with this is you wanna start rolling it into a ball. You're gonna start just by going around your hand a few times and then you're gonna rotate going the other way. And what you wanna make sure you do is don't twist this. It's gonna kind of wanna twist especially as you get started with this. But you don't wanna twist that fabric because then it'll be harder to turn it into a ball later and into a nice flat rug. The other thing I found is you don't wanna leave it in the ball for too long. You just wanna have it in there, maybe for a day or so, however long it takes you uh, to get this together and then go ahead and get going on your actual rug. All right, now I'm gonna do a few it's around here. I've got to untwist a little here so I'm not rolling. All right, now I got my nice little ball going here and I can keep on sewing and then wind about every strip or so. When you get to the very end, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you clip your batting strip a little bit shorter than the end of your final strip of your strip roll, the fabric. Then you're gonna fold it over and so that way you're enclosing that edge and then go ahead and stitch all the way through and back stitch at the end. That's gonna be the blunt end that is in the center of our rug. All right, so I've got my ball all sewn together here and I'm ready to start sewing the rug together, but there's a couple of things we need to do before we get going on that. First and foremost, you've got to clean out your sewing machine. We just sewed through a lot of yards of batting. There's going to be a lot of fuzz in there and you're going to have a much easier time getting all your feed dogs to behave properly if that's nice and clean. Make sure you also take off the plate that goes over your feed dogs and clean out in between those because the batting can really get impacted in there. Then they're not going to work properly. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get a whole bunch of uh, shipping boxes in my case. You can use craft books as well, but we've got to get our table raised up to the height of our sewing machine. If that rug is going to dip over the edge of my extension table at all, it is not going to be flat. It is going to have wobbles in it. It is not going to work out well. All right, now I'm not going to give you this measurement. You got to get the pattern to get it. And they do give you some alternate suggestions depending on what size rug you want to make, but I'm going to do the original size. So so I measured in from my blunt end to the measurement that's specified in the pattern. This is going to be the center of our rug and I'm gonna to need to turn this over and that becomes our first row. All right, so I'm gonna fold this over and line these guys up right where that clip is. Here is a very, very important step or your rug is gonna look a little goofy when it's all done. You wanna make sure that your double fold sides are facing to the left and your single fold sides are facing to the right. That way the outside edge is always gonna be that single 
angled edge and it's gonna look finished on the outside. If not, it's just gonna look a little backwards when everything is said and done. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and do a little clip here at the top. That's gonna be where I'm gonna start. And I'm gonna do a zigzag stitch all the way down here. And then when we get here, we are going to pleat those edges and make like a box corner going around in order to make our way around the rug. These first couple of turns are a little hairy because they're very, very tight, but it does get easier as you get a little bit bigger because the curves round a lot more. All right, so for this giant ball, if you have a basket that you can put at your feet, that's best because then it won't roll all over the place, but you do want to get it out of your way. So I'm just gonna put it on the floor here. Now for these, I'm gonna sew with a zigzag stitch at a 2.0 length and a 5.5 width. That's what's recommended in the pattern. And when I did this on one of mine, it turned out absolutely fabulous. So I recommend that you do the same. I'm gonna go ahead and remove that pin and I'm gonna start off just stitching back and forth. And I'm gonna back this up. All right, so do be careful as you're getting started because I have had that get through too thick twice now uh, as I'm going over that starting part. I just had to turn my sewing machine back off and on again. Not a huge deal. I'm gonna go this manually. There we go, I think we're good to go now. I also have turned my sewing speed down to a medium. Uh, I normally like to just zip through this, but I find that you are a lot better sewer if you just slow it down. You have less skip stitches, and also you're gonna have much better results. All right, so as I go here, I'm just kind of smushing my two ends together. They fit in really nicely because you've got a single edge going into a double fold, so they kind of want to cinch together there. And we're just gonna go nice and slow, doing our little zigzag, trying to keep that join right in the center of our walking foot. All right, so I'm stopping with my needle in the first part where that blunt edge is. And now I'm going to pull this and I'm gonna lift up my presser foot a little bit so that I can pull it so that way it is going to kind of make a right angle turn there. I'm gonna get it as flat as I can, but it will kind of flatten out with use. I'm gonna stop again with my needle down still in that blunt edge just now we're in the other side. We're gonna turn again and now we're gonna turn it back towards us. Now I don't wanna to pull too much on this because I don't wanna already kinda of get that coming up on me because these things tend to warp on you if you try to force the fabric where it doesn't wanna go. All right, so now we got a nice straightaway. So at this point, you just kind of have to make sure that everything stays nice and straight. And we drop some thread here. So if that happens where your thread breaks, you run out of bobbin, anytime you have to start or stop, you wanna start about an inch or so before where you ended, and you're gonna back stitch some to really secure those stitches because you don't want that to be coming out. All right, I'm noticing some skip stitches here, so I'm gonna go ahead and re-thread everything, including my bobbin, and get myself a new needle, which I didn't do, even though I told you guys you should, and before I make that turn. All right, I'm gonna slow down because this is where everything was super thick, and we're gonna have to have another sharp turn here. Eventually, it is gonna get a little easier to make. But what you want to do is kind of ease in a little bit of extra fabric there. Because if you don't, it's going to want to curl up on you and then it is, you're going to have bad results from the start. And you won't lay flat and it will be very, very sad. All right, so always when I'm making these tight curves, I'm stopping with my needle down on the center part and not the strip that I'm adding. I'm going to go ahead and make our way around the rest of the way here. And Keep going. All right, so now's the point. We've made it around those turns twice. We've had that really tight squeeze. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start easing in fabric as I go around to make sure that it works out nicely for me. So to ease it in, all you're gonna do is you're gonna smush it a little bit as you're going, and that is gonna give you a little bit extra fabric on the 
double fold side, the inside, and it's going to have a decent amount of fabric, like just some, enough to make that turn and have it lay nice and flat on the outside. And you just wanna go nice and slow as you're doing this. Then when you get to the straightaway, you can speed up again a little bit. I've also thrown on a pair of quilting gloves. That's gonna help me grip the fabric a little and ease that in some more. So I'm seeing just like a little bit of like a, a wrinkle almost on the inside. You kinda wanna smush and give it a little extra and it doesn't continue to be a wrinkle. It flattens out as you go, but you just wanna smush in a little bit of extra fabric as you're going around there and that will help it lay nice and flat. All right, I'm having to pause to wind up bobbin number two here, and I just want to point out how flat this is. It is because I'm easing in a little bit, and you have to ease in less and less the bigger the curves get. You just don't have to get as much as when you're starting out and that curve is just so sharp. And the first time I did one of these, the pattern says if it gets a little unruly, you can spray a little best press and, and press it and it'll be fine. And you can get it flat that way, but over time where you had to force it to be flat, it will pop back up and then it just doesn't look so good. So I found that if you can do this entire thing without having to iron or press it at all as you're working, that is the best because you just want it to be as flat as flat can be as you're working on it. And if at any point it starts to wobble and bubble up, you need to pick back your stitches, which I know is not fun, but it's easier to do like in the moment rather than when you get to the whole thing and you're like, this is way too wobbly. I've spent too much money on this rug. I've got to fix it. You know, if you start to see it at all, it's time to stop, pick back and go on. So I'm going to go ahead and wind another bobbin, keep going. I think I'm about a third of the way through here and it is looking really good here. I'm really happy with the way it is, the results are, and that it's nice, nice and flat. And again, I have not pressed this. I have not use any best press. Um, this is just going around and gently easing in a little bit around those curves and it's getting less and less as we get a little further out and that curve gets more gradual but I am having to start sooner. I start right when that curve starts is when I start to ease everything in. All right, I'm all the way to the end. I've just got my little tapered end piece here. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna tuck it a little bit underneath so that way it can come to a nice end and we don't have that piece just kind of hanging off there. So that way I can just kind of go over my seam and then all the way to the end there. All right, I'm starting to go over the overlap now. I'm gonna stitch all the way to the edge here. And then I'm gonna back stitch that quite a bit because I don't want that to come apart as it's getting used. All right, so here we have it. We have our finished rug. It is pretty flat. Uh, I definitely am gonna need to give it a little bit of a press, but it's nowhere near the wavy bit that it is. So that's just a good indication. Just need to keep an eye on it as you're going. I was continually doing this and making sure that it would in fact press flat. I will say, so I've made this oval one several times. I've made the straight one several times and I made the circle one just once. Um, the straight one is the easiest one to do. So if you are intimidated by all of this go with that one that's a jelly roll rug squared you're gonna love the way it looks uh, the circle one I think is easier to get to lay flat than the oval and I think it's because you have the same easing in going out around again and again and again and I find that a lot easier than having to go straight and then ease in and straight and then ease in and it just I don't know it's just harder to keep it nice and flat as you go because you're continually having to change what it is that you do as opposed to just continually going round and round and round in a circle. But I love the way that this jelly roll turned out. So this is how it started. We had that little sheet print, which is now in my center, but you can't hardly even tell it's a sheep. I mean, you can when you look real close, but you really just see the color. And then there's some gray and unbleached, different shades of gray, some gray unbleached, and then we have our nice 
black to finish it off and give us a nice contrast. It looks really, really pretty. I really love this one. It really mimics the look of that original uh, strip roll we had that we did with the original Jelly Roll rug video. And I always try to get these black and white ones whenever I find them because I know that you guys love them too. All right, so check it out. We have supplies or we have uh, the rolls while they last. We don't have a ton left, um, so those might be gone relatively quickly, but you can get all of the other supplies from us. So to recap, I think the thread cutter was really cool. I don't think you need it for this project, but if you'd like to do chain piece, and I think that is nice. These bias tape makers that are great for also the Jelly Roll rug because you can fit two and a half inch strips in them. They come in two different sizes. What you're gonna wanna do is measure the width of of if your sewing table will sit in, you'll me need to measure the width of your desk. If it will not, you have an extension table, you're gonna need to measure that. And that's the length that you need in this in-between part. Um, I don't think this is super necessary. If you had an easy time stuffing the strips and you've made one of these before, then I think that you don't need this. If you had challenges with that, then I think that this might be helpful for you. It's not idiot proof. Um, you do have to make adjustments every single time that you put it in. So you're adjusting every four inches or so to make sure everything is turning in. And then I also stitched closer to that uh, double fold side. So I made sure I was getting everything because when I did it myself by hand, I was able to tuck it in a little bit more. And that I found was, was a lot more helpful. Um, Let's see, what else? Machiner's quilting gloves, I would consider those a must have because this does get really heavy as you're wrangling it around with all that batting in it. And that will help you ease everything in and be able to get nice flat seams as you're working. Jeans needles, must have. Um, obviously you can do strip roll. And the batting roll, I would also say is a must have. Um, this is super thin and it's, behaves very well. Um, it is designed to work exactly with this type of a project and it works a lot better than scrap batting and I have tried it with scrap batting and didn't get anywhere near the kind of results that we saw here today. Um, so, and then obviously the pattern by RJ Design. So always support her. There's three different versions that you can do. There's this oval, that rectangle, and then the circle. I would say, again, rectangle easiest, circle second easiest, oval actually the hardest uh, to get nice and flat in the end. All right, well, thanks so much for walk, or watching us as we did a revamp version of our Jelly Roll rug tutorial uh, with this new batting or this new stripper we have that I think looks gorgeous in it. Very modern, very contemporary. And make sure you check out our other videos. We've done one for the other two versions as well, plus how to wash it, what happens with it. And if you screwed up and your one is not flat at all, we show you how to fix it. All right, thanks so much for following along. Make sure you like and subscribe. And also make sure you subscribe to our email list over at shop.quiltaddictsnomis.com. We'll send you a 10% off coupon code that you can use on your first purchase. And you'll get videos like this in your inbox every week. Thanks so much for following along. Until next time, happy quilting.